The world is a place of good, a place where acts of kindness, self-sacrifice and inhuman endurance often go unnoticed by the media and the masses, yet it continues to go on every day. Humans helping humans, humans helping animals. We all live on the planet and we all do our best to help each other. However, for every good thing on the earth, there is always evil. War is prevalent in the media now more than ever, with an ever-present looming threat of war. A global pandemic still reaping its effect on the human race, and killer diseases reportedly being made by many countries. It's safe to say that these evils in the world cause anxiety for everyone. But have you ever stopped to think about people's day-to-day -day lives? How many people are murdered each second of the day? How many families are affected or torn apart by these traumatic events? How many of these cases go unnoticed, undiscovered, unsolved? Today, in the first part of many, where we'll dive into unsolved cases of murder, crime, depravity, and downright inconceivable evil, so that we may learn and educate ourselves, but above all else, look at our lives in perspective and appreciate how we hopefully will never have to endure the physical and psychological torment that the families and survivors have. So, take a seat, grab a snack, and join me as for the first time, we explore. Atlanta 911 operator 7054 with the other thing. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a, I have a question, and this is a serious matter. Um, I just left um my cousin in the house mm -hmm. with the with my kids. Um, she just left my kids in the house when I came back from work, mm -hmm. and my kids, two of my kids are dead. What what am I what do I what do I gotta do? They dead. She left them dead in the house by themselves. Oh, okay, ma'am. Where are you now? I'm in my house. She left my door open. My baby boy, my oldest baby boy, is the only one that's here. The only one that's alive. She left. She let them left them in the house by themselves. She left them in here, and they knocked okay, the stove so on. They were, can you listen? I, when I came in, the stove was laying on my friend's, my youngest son's head, and my other son was laid out on the floor with his brains laid out on the floor. I don't know what to do. I just came home to work from this. <laughs> okay, ma'am, I'm go I'm gonna get EMS and I'm gonna get um police and fire at the at the location. Can you tell me where you're located? Um, 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 ma'am, I can't even talk. This is so serious. I'm so scared. I don't want to get locked up because I was at work. Okay, ma'am. I I understand that you're scared. I completely understand, but I need to get some help out there to you now. Can you tell me where you're located? I understand that, but can you can you please help me? Like, can you please tell me? Like, I don't want to get locked up because this is not my fault. I had just came home from work. I just came home from work. Yes, ma'am. I just came home from work. Okay. Ma'am, the the first thing that I need to do is get some help out there to you. I understand that you're upsetting your They've been in here, dead. Like it, it, it's not, it's no way in the fuck. She left my baby dead, okay. and I don't have no way to okay. reach her. If you if you're not sure if you were at work, ma'am, listen to me. If you were at work while this happened, then the responsibility is gonna fall on your sister if that's who you left them with. Okay? Okay, hold on one moment because I'm gonna also get EMS on the line as well, okay? Yes. Hold please. on one moment. Yes, ma'am. Stay on the line with me though. Hold on one moment for me. Okay.
Okay, tell me exactly what happened. When I just came home from work, my babies was stuck in the stove, dead, and I just came home from work. Wait, my wait, cousin man, wait. was babysitting my kids and left my kids dead in my house. Ain't no telling how long they've been in this house. All right, wait. So you is your is your son? Is he obviously dead? Is he breathing at all? Can you tell he's, he's dead. Out? He's burnt. Both of my children are dead. Their head is burnt. Their their skull is laying on this floor. The stove is the one of my babies is stuck. The stove is pulled over and everything. All right, Elena, can we get PD started to this location? I'm operator eight three nine. Yes, we have PD and fire already en route to that location. All right, thank you so much. Please, Terry, oh please. All right, ma'am. I'm I'm in route, okay? We're in route. Okay, thank you so much. All, all what right. you just listened to is a real 911 call from Lamora Williams to an emergency service operator in October 2017. Lamora claims to the operator that her cousin had killed her kids and she had come back home from work to find them dead. This is not true, however. Lamora was actually using her cousin, who is actually her sister, as being accountable for the kids' deaths, but she was actually the one who killed them. On the phone call, Lamora eventually gives the police her location, before stating that her dead children are inside of an oven, before accusing her sister of leaving them in the house. It's unclear why she tried to pin this horrific act on her sister, some might think that it's something to do with attempting to cover her tracks and play the victim, but her children's father said that Lamora's parents believed that she had been suffering from mental illness since birth. Brenda Williams, her mother, expressed Lamora's difficulty learning and showing disturbing behaviour like cutting off dolls' heads from a young age. Lamora's sister Tabitha also went on to say that Lamora would often leave her children at home unattended and also spoke of her previous suicide attempt. The murder of these boys was struck throughout their local Atlanta community. A vigil was held in their honour and everyone came to pay respects and to support their grieving father and his remaining child. Lamora Williams was indicted with murder, making false statements aggravated assault, concealing a death, and cruelty to children, which was added as at the time of the murder, her three-year-old son was also in the house. Medical examiners declared there was no broken bones or forced trauma, but the boys had been deeply wounded by the oven. As of 2017, there was no news or update in whether Lamora was found guilty and for a while, the case laid in limbo. First at 1230, we're seeing on top of new developments in the 2017 murder case against Lamora Williams. She's the Fulton County mother charged with killing her two sons by putting them inside of an oven. Just in the last two hours, we were in court for Williams final plea hearing. We know she was in the building somewhere in a back room, but she chose not to appear directly in front of the judge. So you're looking at video from a previous court hearing. During the hearing, the state announced that it will specifically select a future trial date. No word yet on when that could be. Arrest warrants from 2017 claim Williams placed her one and two year old sons inside of a hot oven. She's been indicted for their murders. Her trial has been delayed several times because of the pandemic, as well as on hold due to mental health evaluations. As of today, February 2024, Lawyers for the state and defense agreed on a special setting for a final trial date that the Superior Court judge will announce in the future. All we can do now is hope that Lamora faces prison time for her crimes. However, no matter how much time she serves, it will still never be enough to begin healing the pain inflicted on her and the children's family. Jakarta and Keonte Penn were only one and two years old, and sadly, they paid for the incompetence of a sick woman who needed help.
Germany, 1922, March. The winter season was finally coming to an end with snow still lingering in some parts of the country. Germany was battling a poor economy, crumbling societal stability, and above all, morale was low. It's times like this the creation of food and farm produce is essential, so we look towards farmsteads to aid the German people. However, for one family of farmers and their maid, March 31st would be their last day on earth. This is the Hinterkaifeck farm. Home to its five owners, the widowed mother Victoria Gabriel, her two youngest children, Cecilia and Joseph, seven and two years old, and her parents, Andreas and Casilia. While not a family member, their maid was also present the night they died and met a very similar fate. In the months and days leading up to March 31st, many unexplainable and downright terrifying things happened subtly around the farm. The original maid had quit, claiming that she heard noises in the attic and became superstitious that the house was haunted. Andreas found a strange newspaper from Munich on the property, despite no one in the vicinity subscribing to such a paper. The family house key had gone missing, scratches were found on locks, and lastly, and probably most disturbingly, Andreas had told neighbours that he found tracks in the fresh snow, leading from the nearby forest to a broken door lock in the farm's machine room. However, in a decision that could have prevented the brutal murder of his family, he neglected help from others and refused to report anything to the authorities. Later that same night, the entire family heard footsteps in the attic, but upon searching, Andreas found nothing. On the afternoon of March 31st, the family's new maid, Maria Baumgartner, arrived, being escorted by her sister, who left shortly after. She was most likely the last person to see them alive and well. Late that night, four of the five members of the family were lured out into the barn one by one and were murdered before the killer, or killers depending on what you believe, then moved into the house, killed the maid and finally beat the youngest son to death in his cot. Reports differ to how each member died but the general idea is that they suffered smashed skulls, strangulation, broken and shattered jaws. The seven-year-old daughter survived for several hours after the attack and was found with clumps of her own hair in her hands that she had torn out from shock and distress. What happened after is perhaps even more disturbing than the killing itself. The murderer stayed inside the house for four days after. They ate the family food and fed the farm animals. Perhaps this was done to give off the impression that all was okay at the farm. Or perhaps they were just a sick individual who relished in their accomplishment and wanted to get every bit they could out of it. There are surviving images of the bodies that were found in the barn but because of YouTube's guidelines and respect for the family, I won't be showing them. However, if you're interested, you can easily read into it more. Four days later, and a few people came to the farm. Firstly, two coffee sellers, Hans and Edward Shirkovsky, arrived to take an order. But after knocking and looking around the farm, they found nothing, so they left. Cecilia was noticeably absent from school without good reason, and the family were noticed being absent from Sunday worship at their local church. The second person to arrive, Albert Hoffner, the mechanic, also arrived to repair an engine on the farm. He had also not seen the family, but reported hearing animals in the barn, as one might expect to hear. He then proceeded to fix the engine, which took roughly four hours, and then he left. At around 3.30pm, 
Lorenz Schlittenbauer sent his son and stepson, 16 and 9, to the farm to see if they could make contact with the family. They came back and reported they saw nothing. Later, Lorenz, alongside Michael Pohl and Jakob Sigil, went to the farm and finally examined the barns inside, discovering the dead bodies of the family. They soon after found the body of the maid and son inside the house upstairs. The main investigator of the case, George Reinbruber, had a hard time with it initially. There had been a lot of people coming and going on the day, with bodies and items being moved around from their original place, as well as the cooked meals inside of the house. The bodies, or the heads of the bodies, were sent for autopsy. It's there where they found out the daughter had survived several hours after, before dying, and that the main murder weapon was probably a mattock. The main theory for the murders at the time was a home robbery, but this was shut down when a large pile of money was still found in the house. The last investigation to ever take place was in 1986, and to this day the case remains unsolved. In the investigation of the case, a list of roughly 11 suspects were made of people who were most likely to have done it. First was Lorenz Schlittenbauer, one of the men who originally found the family. Lorenz was believed to have had a relationship with Victoria and had fathered Joseph. When they discovered the bodies, the other two men reported that Lorenz entered the house via a locked door, which he suspiciously had a key to. He claimed that he went to find Joseph. It is possible he had a key if he was truly the lover of Victoria, or perhaps just because he was a trusted neighbour, but the disappearance of the family house key prior to the attack raised his eyebrows. In the years after, many people assumed Lorenz to be the killer, even giving him the title of the murderer of Hinton Kaifek. He was also heard giving extensive details about the ground type of the day and how the murderer tried to bury the remains but failed due to frozen grounds. As he himself was a neighbour and familiar with the farmland, he could have just been making an estimated guess. Lorenz was never formally convicted of having anything to do with the murders at all. The next suspects were the Gump brothers, Adolf and Anton Gump. They were investigated in 1951 after their sister claimed on her deathbed that the two were responsible for the murders, of which Anton remained in police custody for a while. Adolf, however, had died in 1944. In 1954, the case against them was dismissed, as there was basically no evidence. It's worth noting that Adolf Gump was listed as a suspect as early as April 9th, because of his connection to the Freikorps Oberland, a voluntary paramilitary group who fought against communist and Polish insurgents. Karl and Andreas S. and Peter Weber had similar stories to that of the Gump brothers, but they also went nowhere. The former maid of the farm cited Anton and Karl Beichler as the killers, two men who had worked at the farm before. The maid said that Beichler spoke to her often about the family, often saying things like they ought to be dead. She also emphasised that the family dog who barked at everyone never once barked at Anton. Both brothers knew of the family's fortune. She believed that the brothers, alongside their friend George Siegel, had the family killed. George even claimed to have made the handle of the murder weapon when he worked on the farm and knew of its positioning within the farm. However, despite all of these suspects, the two most likely were that of Paul Mueller and Carl Gabriel. Carl was the husband of the widowed Victoria Gabriel. He was reportedly killed in 1914 during World War I from artillery fire, but a body was never found. People began speculating the le legitimacy of his death. 
Joseph was conceived during her husband's service, which led people to believe that Victoria and her father Andreas had an incestuous relationship, which was apparently known within the village and documented in a court. Andreas was found to be sexually assaulting his daughter, and both were convicted of incest within the town. At the end of World War II, war captives who were released from Soviet captivity claimed they had been sent home by a German man who called himself the Hinterkaifeck murderer. However, some men later revised their statement. Many believe that this man was in fact Karl Gabriel, and those who claimed to see him after his death said he wanted to go to Russia. Finally, the most likely suspect of all, and the one who is cited by most people who investigate this case as the main suspect and most likely to have done it, Paul Mueller was a German immigrant who had been previously the only suspect in a murder of a Massachusetts family in 1898. Based on American newspaper research, it's believed that Paul killed dozens of victims. The Hinterkaifeck murders were similar to many crimes in the US, including the murder of an entire family in an isolated home using the blunt edge of a farm tool, as well as moving the bodies and the noticeable absence of any thievery in the house. It's believed that he might have departed from the US to Germany in 1912 after authorities and journalists began to notice patterns in the family murders. The case has never been solved. However, it was revisited in 2007 where many chastised the authorities at the time for lack of DNA evidence taking, which was becoming the norm at the time. But while a list was narrowed down, it ultimately evolved to nothing. The farm was destroyed only a year after the killings, and a memorial still stands to this day as a grim reminder of the evil that occurred on the night of March 31st, 1922. This is Catherine Mary Knight, born October 24th, 1995, to Barbara Rohan and Ken Knight. Barbara was married to a Jack Rohan before she met Ken, who was at the time a friend and co-worker of Jack. Barbara and Ken were forced to move to Moore after local backlash, to which none of her sons went with her. Two of the sons stayed with Jack, and the other two moved to live with their aunt in Sydney. Barbara had four more children with Ken, of which two twin girls, one of them being Catherine. In 1959, her ex-husband Jack died, so his two eldest sons moved in with Barbara and Ken. Ken was a violent alcoholic, though. He would relentlessly sexually assault Barbara up to 10 times a day, who in turn often opened up to her daughters about how much she hated men and sex because of these events. Catherine complained to her mother one day about one of her partners wanting to take part in a sex act that she did not want to perform in, to which her mother told her to put up with it and stop complaining. Catherine claims she was sexually assaulted by several members of her family until she was 11, though, surprisingly enough, never by her father, despite his track record. However, this is a very debated topic, with some people being sceptical on the claims. But as her psychiatrists have accepted her claims, and they have been largely confirmed by other family members, it's hard to diminish what she said. Catherine's school life in Muse Wellbrook High School was isolated to say the least. She was remembered by her schoolmates as a loner and a bully to smaller kids. She assaulted one boy at a school with a weapon and was injured by a teacher at one occasion. Catherine, when not in a rage-induced anger, was said to be a model student with potential who often earned rewards and praise for her behaviour. After leaving school at 15, without the ability to read or write, she began work as a cutter in a clothing factory. 
A year later, she began working in a butcher's shop, where she would quickly be promoted and gifted her own set of butcher's knife, which she would always hang above her bed. So as Catherine said, they would always be handy if I needed them. This tradition would stay with her for many, many years. In 1973, Catherine met David Stanford Keller, who was a heavy drinker, which came from two traumatic incidents he had been a part of in his previous railway job. Firstly, his best friend was killed in front of him during a shunting accident, and later he rescued injured children from a school bus which had been struck by a train, killing six of them. He lost his job soon after for his deteriorating behaviour and overall job performance. Often when David got into fights, Catherine would be right next to him, ready to fight alongside him. Catherine married David in 1974. On the day of their wedding, Barbara gave David advice, saying things along the line of, watch out for Catherine because she will kill you if you do her wrong. Catherine later tried to strangle David that same night, because he fell asleep after having intercourse three times. The marriage, to no one's surprise, was a violent one. She frequently argued and hit him, even once with a frying pan. David escaped to their neighbours one night before collapsing and being admitted to hospital with a severely fractured skull. Catherine managed to get the charges against her dropped though. In May 1976, after Catherine gave birth to their first child, Melissa Ann, David left her for another woman because he couldn't cope with the abuse anymore. The next day, she was seen carelessly pushing a baby in its pram with little to no care for its well-being at all. This led Catherine to be committed to St. Elmo's Hospital in Tamworth for postnatal depression, to which she spent several weeks recovering. Upon release, she would place her child on train tracks and take an axe into town to threaten people. Luckily, a well-known man in the town found the baby before anything bad happened. Catherine was then readmitted to St. Elmo's, but apparently recovered and signed herself out the next day. A couple days later, she would go on to slash the face of a woman with one of her knives and threatened her to drive her to Queensland so she could track down David. When stopping at a gas station, the woman managed to escape. But when the police arrived, Catherine had taken a boy hostage, but she was swiftly disarmed by the police, who took her in and admitted her to a Morris Psychiatric Hospital. When the police informed David of the incident, he left his girlfriend and moved back to Aberdeen with his mother to support Catherine. She was released on August 9th, 1976, to the care of her mother-in-law and David, who all moved to Ipswich. On March 6th, 1980, they had another child, Natasha Marie. In 1984, Catherine left David to a house in Musewellbrook. She would injure her back the next year and go on disability pension for the foreseeable future. The government gave her a housing commission residence in Aberdeen. Catherine would go on to have three other relationships. David Sanders. In 1987, she cut the throat of his two-month-old dingo pup in front of him as an example of what would happen if he had an affair before she knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. She would then give birth to her third daughter, Sarah, which encouraged the two to pay down for a house. Catherine decorated the house with animal skins, horns, skulls, animal traps, machetes, rakes, pitchforks. Everything was filled with something. One argument led Catherine to hit David with an iron and then stab him with scissors. He would later leave after this and return a few years later to see his daughter to find that Catherine had put out an apprehended violence order against him. Her next partner was John Chillingworth in 1991. Catherine became pregnant with him and gave birth to a boy named Eric. The relationship lasted a whole three years before she left him for another man whom she'd be having an affair with for quite a while, John Price. John Charles Thomas Price would be the last of her partners before her incarceration. John had three children at the time of having his affair, and was generally well liked by most of the neighbours and community. Catherine moved into his house in 1995, despite the fact he was aware of her violent outbursts. In 1998, 
The two fought over his refusal to marry her, where in retaliation, she recorded a video of items he had allegedly stolen from his workplace and gave it to his boss. Although all the items were either out of date or from a rubbish tip at his work, his boss still had to fire him after 17 years of dedication to the job. That same day, John kicked her out and returned her to her own house. A few months later, Price restarted the relationship, but without her moving into his house this time. The fighting became more frequent and many of John's friends left him. In February 2000, a series of assaults on John built up with Catherine finally stabbing him in the chest. He at last kicked her out of his house for good. On the 28th of February, he took out a restraining order to keep himself and his children safe from Catherine. John chillingly told his co-workers that if he was not in work tomorrow, it would be because Catherine had killed him. His co-workers, of course, begged him not to go home, but he feared for his children and proceeded home. Upon arriving, he sent his kids away on a sleepover at a friend's house, and then spent the night at his neighbour's before returning home at 11pm. Catherine arrived at John's house while he slept, and she sat watching TV for a bit before having a shower. She then woke Price up for sex, after which he fell asleep. At 6am the next day, a neighbour became concerned when noticing John's car had not moved from its space all night. His employer also sent a worker to check on him. Both the neighbours and the worker tried repeatedly to contact John. They alerted the police when they all saw blood on the front door. The police broke down the door and found John's body alongside Catherine's, who was comatose on the floor after taking a large number of pills. She had stabbed Price with a butcher's knife when he was sleeping. Going by blood evidence, he woke up, turned on a light and attempted to escape while Catherine chased him. He managed to open the front door and get out, but he was presumably dragged back in and bled out in the hall. The later autopsy revealed he had been stabbed at least 37 times in the front and back of his body. Several hours after his death, Catherine had skinned him and hung the skin on a meat hook. She then decapitated John and cooked various parts of his body serving up the meat with potatoes and vegetables. The dinner table was set with two plates with name cards on them, each with the name of Price's children. A third meal was prepared, but thrown out, presumably made for herself, but she couldn't stomach to eat it. John's head was found in a pot of vegetables, with the pot still being warm by the time they were found, at around 40 to 50 degrees. She left a note on top of a picture of John, but they were found to be groundless, and more likely than not, the ramblings of an insane woman. In court, Catherine pleaded not guilty, and refused responsibility for her crime. Her legal team, and a team of therapists and psychologists, broke down her actions into mental illness-induced, like disassociation, amnesia, and BPD. Despite this, she was sentenced to life in jail. She applied for parole in 2006, but was denied, and will probably never get parole. She still, to this day, serves her sentence, with no record of violence inside of jail. As of 2024, she is currently 68 years old. Catherine Mary Knight will go down in history as the first Australian woman to be given the sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. That concludes our first look into the world of disturbing crimes. A mentally ill woman, a disturbing domestic homicide, and a cannibal. These are just some of the people who have stained history and made hell a reality for the families and the families surrounding them. There are plenty more people out there who have done more despicable, deplorable, or downright just weird things. So join me next time 
as we take a look at another set of individuals. <laughs> 